This episode is going to be a little different. We've been through the cases of Kathy Milliken, Betsy Critchley, Bernice Courdemanche, Ellen Freed, Eva Morse, Linda Moore, and Barbara Agnew. All of these women were murdered before Jane's attack in 1988. We've gotten to know them. We've come to hopefully care about them. And that brings us to Jane. Jane and I are in Claremont, New Hampshire, at the covered bridge over the Sugar River where Ellen Freed's body was found. We're leaning against my car that's parked on a haphazard shoulder on a dirt road. It's muddy, and mosquitoes nip at our bare arms. Jane lights a cigarette and puffs quietly, watching the smoke drift over the river. Like Ellen didn't know. Eva didn't know. Elizabeth didn't know. Bernice didn't know. You know, he took them and he took them to wherever he took them and they didn't know what was going to happen. I didn't know why he was there initially. I didn't know why he was there. I didn't know that there was a possibility that he had done that before. I didn't know what kind of man he was and what kind of monster he turned out to be. I didn't know. Not until he stabbed me. Then I knew what kind of monster he was. But I didn't know. Do you feel ready to talk about your attack? Yeah. Let's do it. Sounds good. I'm noticing you feel kind of raw right now. Yeah. <laughs> Is that okay that we talk about it? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, let's do it. We get into my car. You want to come in on this side? And I Jane briefly makes it. fun of me for wearing sandals in the mud. Next time wear sneakers. I know, I totally <laughs> forgot them. And I roll the tape. What you're about to hear is uncut and raw. You're listening to Dark Valley an investigative series from Crawl Space Media and Glassbox Media. I'm your host, Jennifer Amell. This is episode eight. Dark Valley is possible because you listen. Be an advocate for these cases by rating and reviewing Dark Valley. It really does make a difference. Episodes are released weekly, but if you want to binge the whole series, sign up for our subscription show on Apple Podcasts and get exclusive access to bonus content. So whenever you're ready, let's let's try and go back to before the attack before the attack what was the night like what were you doing uh it was hot humid decided to go to a fair cheshire county fair right in swansea swansea heen right on the line and um Walked around the fair, ran into a few people I knew. Of course, they have to come up and do the belly rub because I was seven months pregnant. So my belly was right out there, right out there. 
did short conversations with a lot of people that I ran into. And uh, ran into Dennis's mom. And uh, we decided to hang out. Um, walked around. I think we even got something to eat. I'm not sure. I think we did. Of course, fair is fair food's the best food. <laughs> so uh, we found these. Well, we found this tent with a bunch of stuffed animals hanging off the the tent poles, and it was a bunch of machines that you pop quarters into this machine and it pushes quarters off the edge and if the quarters come off the edge you keep the quarters or you reuse them or whatever and then there's tokens on top of those quarters and if you happen to get a token fall off the edge you gotta stuff the animal um that was back in the 80s today they put like 50 dollar bills and 20 dollar bills on the top So me and Dennis's mom, God, we were there on the machines for a few hours anyways, just playing those quarter machines and talking and playing the quarter machines. And we kept winning these tokens for the stuffed animals and uh, kept saying, oh, there's another stuffed animal for Jessica because I had already known that I was having a daughter and I had already named her. So we're like, oh, there's another stuffed animal for Jessica. And so we played that for a few hours. I ended up with, I ended up with so many stuffed animals that the guy had to give me a plastic, this big clear plastic bag to carry the stuffed animals to my car. And uh, it was a lot of fun. We enjoyed that. And so the fair started closing up. And we started walking back to the main entrance and I was super thirsty, but all the stands were closed and um, so I couldn't get anything to drink. And then as we were walking to the front gate, ran into Dennis's dad. So I say goodbye, my goodbyes to them and uh, went to my car with my bag of stuffed animals. Felt like I was carrying them like Santa Claus, a big sack of over my shoulder <laughs> so I got to my car and I threw threw the bag in the back in the back seat and um, started driving home and I was still wicked thirsty it was so hot and um, I knew back then a lot of the stores obviously closed early and at this time it was like what, midnight somewhere around there so the stores were closed. But I a lot, back then, a lot of the stores had um, vending soda machines outside. And I knew this one store that I was going by was going to have one. So I pulled in there, and uh, it was Camarillo's Food and Circus, right on Route 10. Circus? Food and Circus. Oh. There's no circuits. <laughs> There's no circus there. <laughs> it's just, uh, it was like a small... Oh, and it's still there, actually. It's a small um, grocery market. Um, little local store. It has pretty much everything. It has groceries and and uh, veggies and a deli and stuff like that. So um, I pulled in there, and I was parked right in front of the, the payphone. There was a soda machine, and then the payphone was right next to it. Yes, they had pay phones back then. We're talking about the time that they had pay phones. Um, so I, um, <laughs> of course, with the push coin machines, I did not have much change in my pocketbook. <laughs> so I'm digging through my pocketbook and I think the sodas were like 50 cents then. Of course, they don't take dollars. So um, I went up to the soda machine to get a soda, put my money in, pushed the button, and I got nothing. And I was like, are you kidding me? So I went back to my car and rustled through my pocketbook again and 
I don't, I don't know how I did, but I ended up finding cha- some more change and went to the soda machine and the soda machine gave me two sodas. So I guess it was, a, they wanted me to buy two sodas. I don't know, <laughs> but I got two sodas. So I um, went back to my car and I sat there for a minute. I think I had some stuff all over my seat from my pocketbook. So I was kind of putting stuff in my pocketbook and this vehicle had pulled up on the right side of my car and parked right next to me on the passenger side. I didn't pay any attention. Yeah. He was there for either the payphone or the soda machine. And um, I had no reason to be concerned. I mean, this was a small town, New Hampshire, Swansea, which in the 80s virtually had no major crime. Um, At least that I ever heard of. I felt safe. So I... um, I sat there for, I don't know, maybe a minute, opened my soda, took a drink of my soda. I think I was still straightening, putting stuff back in my pocketbook. And I was just getting ready to start my car. And I saw the guy walk out of, get out of his vehicle and walk around the back of my vehicle. And for a split second, I thought, wow, that's weird. Why is he walking behind my car? Soda machine and the the payphone were in front of his vehicle. And before I knew it, he was at my car door. My window was rolled all the way down. And he was at my car door where I was sitting. And like simultaneously was, is the payphone working? and he immediately opened my car door. And he wanted me to go, he tried pulling me out of the car. And um, I got really scared. I was like scared and confused. What does this guy want? And I, I started screaming. I started screaming as loud as I could. He, he tried to pull me out of the car. He wanted me to go with him. And I, w- I was determined I wasn't going to go with him. Um, I could tell he wanted me to go with him by him pu- trying to pull me out of the car. And then before I knew it, he was like between me and the steering wheel. And, and I was trying to fight him off, trying to fight him, you know, fight him off, trying to get him out of my car. And somehow I got my, my leg up to kick him. And I ended up kicking my windshield and smashed my windshield. My windshield just shattered. And then the next thing I know, he takes a knife out of his back pocket. And he was, and he was still like in my face between me and the steering wheel. And he takes the knife out of his back pocket and he says, Maybe this will persuade you to get out of the car. And I was scared then. I didn't know what he was gonna do. And I was like, please don't hurt me, I'm pregnant. And that didn't face him at all. I don't even think he was listening to me. So I got out of the car and I was standing by the driver's door. I shut the door and I was standing by the driver's door and he had the knife like, pretty close to my neck and all of a sudden he he was I was like what do you want what do you want and and then this part really confused me he said you beat up my girlfriend I said I ain't beat nobody up and by this time I'm like oh my god this guy's a freaking fruitcake and I was like I didn't beat anybody up I'm seven months pregnant and he said, well, isn't this a Massachusetts car? So as he said that, he was walking to the back of my car. And I was just like, I have New Hampshire plates. And I was really confused by this time. Like, 
all right, maybe this guy is just confusing me with somebody else. He was so super calm, but yet he didn't make any sense. So I went from scared to confused. All right, I didn't feel so scared. I felt like, okay, this guy is a fruitcake. He just confused me with somebody else. Maybe he'll leave. Next thing I know, he starts walking back to his vehicle. And I could see him over the top of the roof of my car. And I turn around and I'm like, hey, asshole, what about my windshield? Because by by this time, I'm fr- I'm like, I'm not scared anymore. I'm, I was confused. I'm not confused anymore. I'm pissed because I have a smashed windshield. And he came right back to me, like walked right back to me. He didn't really run, he just briskly walked back towards me, came back around to my side of the car and put the knife up against my neck again. So pissed off, turned back to fear. And I was scared. I didn't know what he was gonna do. And he was trying to get me to go with him again. I was not going with him. I was not going with him. He was, I don't know that he actually asked me to go with him, but he was definitely pulling me towards his vehicle. He didn't say a lot. But he was so, so calm about everything. I think that's the weirdest thing I can remember about him. He never got excited. He never seemed mad. He was just so calm about everything. It was as if when I, you know, made it clear to him by pulling away from him that I wasn't going with him, it wasn't as if he was pissed off about that or real aggressive with it. It was really weird. So then I, um, we stood there for a couple of seconds and I saw a vehicle coming down the road. The first vehicle we saw since I was there. And since he was there. And I just, I knew, I said to myself, Jane, you don't run to that road, you're, you're done. And I just, I ran and screamed towards the road as fast as I could. And I screamed as loud as I could, help. And they just drove by. And as I was running towards the road, he tackled me right down, just like a football player tackled somebody down. And before I knew it, I was on my back. And he was on top of me. He was like kneeling beside me. Or he was like, he had one knee on one side and and he was like standing on his foot on the other side. And he just proceeded to stab. And I just, I couldn't comprehend what the hell was going on. And all I could think about was I need to say, I need to protect my baby. I need to protect my belly. So I have, I, I just, I just kept, I, I knew that he was, he was stabbing me in the hands. Defensive, uh, defensive stabs. Cause I was, I was trying to defend myself and defend my belly. And he just continued to stab and stab and stab. It's just like, like, just so many times and I could literally literally as as much as I was trying to defend myself he was just all over my chest all over my chest and my hands I, I could literally hear every time he stabbed me I could literally hear the flesh as he was pulling the knife out of me sound I'll never forget. 
I'll never forget that sound of just the knife going in and just the flesh when he was pulling it out. And he just stabbed so fast and so many times. Did you feel pain? I don't remember the pain. Maybe that's a blessing to me. I don't remember the pain. And then the next thing I know, he just, um, just as calm as, and cool as he, just as calm as he was before, he was just that calm. He just got up. It just stopped. I'm laying there on my back and the stabbings just stopped. And he got up on, got up and I can hear him walk away. He wasn't running. I know he wasn't running. I could hear him walking away. And I was laying there just looking at the sky and processing what just happened to me or trying to process. And I, I just immediately um, rolled over on my belly and tried so hard to get up on my hands and knees. And I got up on my hands and knees and I can literally hear and feel the blood just gush out of me. It was just gushing out of me. And I knew I had to get help. And I said to myself, I'm not gonna die. I've gotta get help. And then I hear his vehicle come towards me. And I don't know, for maybe a split second, I thought, oh my God, he's gonna run me over. And he didn't, he didn't. He just slowly, I'm on my hands and knees and I'm watching the vehicle come and, and he just slowly drove by me. And I think it was intentional. He intentionally slow drove right near me, right in front of me, and looked right down at me. His window was down, and he just looked right at me, like almost no expression, just looked right down at me. That's a, that's a vision I'll never forget. Pause there for a moment. Can you describe his face? He had a high hairline, blonde hair, light, light colored hair. But then we don't know either because of the lighting in the, there was fluorescent lighting, I guess, in the parking lot. He had a slim face, very slim face. Um, that's probably the best I can describe it. Technically. Yeah. What about his eyes? I don't know. It's almost like a cold, cold eyes. Like, it was almost like he looked right through me. His eyes just pierced right through me. They were, um, I want to say dark, dark colored eyes. Is this the first moment you got a look, a good look at his face? No. Yeah. Yeah, because, I mean, I'm the type of person that, if I'm mad, I'm not gonna look at you. And there was a good time, a good amount of time before he attacked me. I was pretty pissed off at him. So I really didn't look at him. Like when I, when he was walking back to his vehicle, when I looked over the car and saw him walking back to his vehicle, I mostly saw the side and the back of him. Um, and when he looked at the license plate, I didn't really look at him much. I knew that he looked at the license plate, but I didn't really look at him much because I was pissed. 
I was pissed about my windshield. So that that vision of him when he was driving by looking down at me, that was probably the most best visual I, I had of him. Probably the first time I actually really looked at him when he really looked at me. Did he have facial hair at all? No. He was clean shaved. What about his haircut? Short. It was a short haircut. No glasses or anything? No, I don't remember glasses, no. Do you remember what he was wearing? Not really. I think a while back I had um I had mentioned dark clothing. But that was a long time ago. But you don't have a memory of that right now? No. Not really. Do you ever notice a wedding ring? Nope. Nope. And what about the knife? When he took the knife out, I I don't remember him having to flip it out. Mm -hmm. I just remember the knife coming out. So I really don't think it was a flip knife. I think it just came out and it was there. Mm -hmm. Now, did he already have it flipped before he got in the car? I don't know if it was a flip knife. Mm But I don't think it was. I don't think it was. That was kind of wide. Was it um, like a blade on both sides? No. Just on one side? I remember just on one side, yeah. yeah. Did you ever see the handle on it? No. We'll be right back after a quick word from our sponsors. Thank you for listening. Now, back to the show. So tell me what happened after he drove away. So I was was getting on my hands and knees. He drove by me and looked right at me. And and then he just drove off. He didn't speed off. He just drove off. I can hear him just driving off. So I knew, I knew I had to get help. After he drove by me and drove off, it was like I, my focus was getting to my car. I had to get to my car. So I really didn't see where he went. So, when I got to my car, I, um, I was, my, my handle flips up on my car door. And I'm standing there and I'm, I'm trying to flip my handle up to open the door. And my thumb was not working. And I, I just, I'm like, what the heck? I, I'm trying to open it up, trying to get out of there. Because I kind of thought that he was going to come back too to see if I was still alive. So I finally got my car door open and I get my car and then I'm trying to turn the key and I couldn't turn the key with my thumb because my thumb wasn't working. Come to find out he had cut the tendon in my thumb. So, you know, that was a defensive wound. So I finally was able to get, I don't know how, but I got my car started and um, I backed up and and started going down the road in the direction I was already headed to go home. And um, I was just, I could hear the blood just gushing out of me. And I could feel myself getting weaker and weaker. I know I was losing a shitload of blood. 
So I was driving down the road and trying to go for help. Wasn't sure if I was going to make it home or not. But then I, I remembered I had a friend that lived right on that road. And it was very close. So I just wanted to get to his house to get help. And before, next thing I know, I'm behind him. I'm, I'm like, I'm behind this vehicle. I'm like, are you, you cannot tell me I'm behind him. I'm like, really behind him? I'm like, oh my God, I'm right, be, I'm right behind him. He's in front of me. What was going through your head when you saw this car? What was he driving? He was driving a Jeep Wagoneer. Which is a pretty large SUV. Back in the 80s. Um, it was like a, a square box, like big SUV. I had wood grain siding. I just couldn't believe I was behind him. So then I was even more scared because I was like, oh my God, he's gonna see where I pull in. But I, I drove two miles up the road behind him and I pulled into my friend's house that was two miles up the road. And I immediately got out of the car and by this time I was pretty weak. I, I had lost a lot of blood. A lot of blood. And I walked up to his steps and before I even got to his steps, my friend Bob, he, he was there at the door. It was a really hot night, so his door was open and the screen door was was closed. So he immediately came up to the screen door and I was just like, some asshole just stabbed the shit out of me. You need to get me help. And I, I got like two steps up his stairs and I just I just collapsed on the stairs. I just collapsed on the stairs. And the next thing I remember is Pa was putting a pillow underneath my neck. Because come to find out, it must have been when I ran from him. He had sliced my neck and sliced my juggler. And so I was bleeding like really bad from my neck. And I guess that's where I was losing most of my blood. That's why I was feeling so, so weak. I was literally bleeding to death. And so Bob came and he put a pillow underneath my neck. And all of a sudden we hear a vehicle like almost speeding by the house. And all of a sudden it was like as if they just slammed on their brakes and, and you could hear the tires squeal by the house, by his driveway, going the opposite direction from where I came from. And I'm like, oh my God, Bob, that's him. That's him, I know it's him, I know it's him. And then we heard it take off and Bob had ran in to get his gun. I find out later that he ran in to get his gun and his brother lived next door. So his brother ran over and he had a gun too. And then the next thing I know, a cop was there, which happened to be a really good friend of ours, Petey Farnham. And um, so Petey came and that's when I knew it was bad. I, I kind of had the feeling in my mind that it was bad, but it was like reality, the way Petey looked at me. Just, I saw the look in his face, like, like he was like in disbelief. Like, this girl's gonna die. It was, it was, that was the way he looked at me. And I heard him on the radio calling for rescue. And Petey was talking to me. He was like, Jane, Jane, who did this to you? And I'm like, I don't know. And he's like, did Dennis do this to you? And I'm like, no. And he's like, do you know who he is? I, no, I don't. 
And then at that time, I was like in and out of consciousness. And I can keep hearing them say, Jane, wake up. Jane, wake up. And I just like, I was like, I'm going to die. And they're like, no, you're not going to die. You're not going to die. Wake up. And I really thought I was going to die. And it was like forever for rescue to get there. And I hear Petey calling all these cops. I need assistance. I need assistance. And I could, I could hear the desperate in his voice. And I knew it was bad. I knew it was bad. Just the desperate in his voice. He just, he wanted more help. And it took forever and the, the rescue still wasn't there and I was still going in and out of consciousness and it felt like forever before rescue got there. And then all of a sudden I hear Petey say, I don't care who's coming, I need rescue here now we come to find out afterwards keen rescue was on their way to get me and had to turn around because they would have been out of their jurisdiction <laughs> their fucking jurisdiction so winchester ended up coming and getting me I still can't comprehend that. So, um, and I, I barely remember the ride to the hospital. The, I remember rescue coming and starting to cut my clothes off me. And, and just, uh, I can remember one of the EMTs were just, I, 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 coming in and out of consciousness. Every time I woke up, I can see everybody over me. And I just see oh, the looks on their faces. And then I, I don't remember them putting me in rescue, but I remember he was trying to wake me up in rescue. Jane, Jane. They, they just kept waking me up, waking me up. Jane, Jane, stay with me. Talk to me. When are you going to have your baby? And then I remember being at the hospital and I was laid on this, this, I don't even think it was a bed or a cot. I think it was a big table. And there was these bright lights on me. And I, um, I remember them. They just kept saying, there's another one. There's another one. There's another one. And the other ones were stab wounds. They just kept finding stab wounds. And I, I can remember saying, my baby, my baby. And this doctor, he was, he was so nice. I can remember him saying to me, Dr. Seiss, he just passed away a couple of years ago. I can remember him saying to me, your baby's gonna be fine. We hear a heartbeat, your baby's gonna be fine. And then everybody was just working so fast around me. It was just crazy. And just every time I opened my eyes, there was these bright lamps on me. And, and I, I can remember I was saying, my thumb, my thumb. Nobody was looking at my thumb. And then they, they realized what was wrong with my thumb. I don't know why that bothered me. Probably because I couldn't open the car door and I couldn't start my car with it. I was just like, my thumb. I'm looking at your hands right now. Are those scars from the attack? Yep. 
here and here and here and here because I went like that and here and some of them have faded oh there was one here You can see them right here. So many on your hands. Yeah. Tried to protect my baby. It was. Oh, right here was one. That one was pretty deep, too. My thumb was the worst on my thumb. Looks like they did a lot of surgery on that. Yeah. Thing. And there's two here. Right there. Right here. Your wrists. Yeah. There's one on your neck, too. Yeah, that's a pretty big one. Right here. That is big. That's where I lost most of my blood. I was just, it was just coming out. I don't know that I would be here if I wasn't pregnant. I don't know if I would have had that much will to survive. That much want to survive. But I thought about her so much. I just, I'm... I wanted her to live. Why did he do this to us? Why? Why did he do this to me? Why did he do this to them? I don't understand it. What gives him the right? God, I hate him so much. I wish he knew how much I hated him. I really do. I don't think I've ever told it like that before. I felt every bit of it. That was raw. I told that from the heart. Thank you for opening up like that. And I don't expect it's easy to come back from that either. It just never goes away. Yeah. As much healing as I've tried to do, and as much as I've tried to just move forward, it just never goes away. It never does. We'll be right back after a quick word from our sponsors. Thank you for listening. Now, back to the show. Jane gets a phone call. She answers and nods. She hangs up and says, he's home. He said to come over. So we drive back through Claremont, hop on Route 12, and speed along the Connecticut River. We pass signs for Keene and take an exit for Swansea. Marlowe's store blurs past on our right. The parking lot is empty. And I realize we're on the same route Jane took all those years ago. And about two miles up the road, we pull into a long gravel driveway. We can hear the dogs barking. A few derelict trailers rust on the lawn. Old tires and bits of radiators and engine parts are scattered all over the property. A tall, white-haired man in coveralls stands at the head of the drive. I guarantee it's going to be a long time before you forget about me. (laughs) (laughs) Never, Bob, never. This is Bob. 
the man who saved Jane's life that night 36 years ago. So, yeah, do you remember how hot and humid it was that night? Not really, because I was too focused on cleaning up the rubbish because the dog, dog gets upset, screws rubbish all over the place. What were you doing? So you were cleaning that up I before I got there. Up. Yeah. Yeah. I was still cleaning that up when, when you knocked. You were breathing kind of real hard and trying to understand what you were saying because it, it was kind of choppy. Yeah. And made out that you were at the mallows. You got stabbed. You were bleeding like a stuffed pig. Well, four years later, there were still blood stains on that step. Really? Yeah. Then a vehicle was slowing down on the tent. It was about four or five minutes after the fact. And you were scared to death that there was that person. Of course, it was a kind of a blur. I could make out it was a uh, four-wheel drive. Didn't really know what, but just at that moment is when I disappeared, grabbed my shotgun, and came back out. Because if they came into the yard, they were going to leave in a body bag. So you didn't get a good look at the at the vehicle no. that pulled up. No, it, I remember hearing the tires squeal, like it stopped and then took yeah, off. Yeah, screech, screeching a little bit, slowing down. That's when I went. I, it was maybe twenty feet away, so. I'm, and then it took off. Yeah, slowed right down and saw our movement and stuff and took right off again. Yeah. I felt anxious and, and worried, but I wasn't scared. Kind of confused was, about what oh, was yeah, going on. confused, but, you know, the heart rate and the adrenaline was pumping and, you know, mm. and, yeah, I felt angry, too, that, you know, somebody did this to my friend. Well, I have to say, um, for a long time, I felt really bad about what you had to see. And I'm extremely grateful that you were home. Pray to God it never happens again, but I'd be there in a heartbeat. I know you would. Yeah, I'm grateful. Very. I don't know what I would have done if you weren't home. No, you would have made it. <laughs> you were just that stubborn of a person. <laughs> good thing I'm good at putting two and two together. <laughs> Come up with 11. <laughs> Did you know that 10 plus 10 and 11 plus 11 are the same thing? Huh? Really? Yeah. 10 plus 10 is 20. 11, 11 is 22. Oh, now I get it. Now I get it. I'm a little slow. Uh, we won't hold it against you <laughs> that right. you're from Vermont. Yeah, 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 yeah. You, you do know that Vermont cows are not allowed in New Hampshire because they'll tip over, right? <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. Growing up on the hill of, hills of Vermont, the legs on one side are shorter than the other. Jane and I get in the car to leave, and Bob opens Jane's door for her. He plays it off like a joke. But there's something sincere in his voice. Because when you decided to get married, oh, you didn't even consider me. <laughs> oh hell. Well, you <laughs> kind of waited 36 years, so. I waited longer than that incident. Jane's story doesn't end here. Next time on Dark Valley, the investigation heats up when Jane gets a mysterious package in the mail. Uh, she sent me a, a package, like a package envelope with a bunch of information. I open the packet and she explains to me in this packet that she's a private investigator and she believes that she knows who my attacker was.
Dark Valley is produced, written, and edited by me, Jennifer Amell. It's also made possible by executive producers with Crawl Space Media, Tim Polari, and Lance Reinsterna. Follow us on social, at Dark Valley Show. Production assistants include Amanda Bedard and Marianne Stone White. Show art by Pamela Robinson. Original theme song by Jennifer Paig. Please see the show notes for additional music credits, courtesy of Pixabay. And if you have a tip for any of these cases, please call the New Hampshire State Police Cold Case Unit at 603-271-2663 or the Vermont State Police Major Crimes Unit at 802-244-8781. Or you can write to us at darkvalleyshow at gmail.com. Until next time.